In the last video, I described a scheme for password security whereby a server could store the cryptographic hash of a password rather than the actual password itself inside of a password file. So if you had a password file, what the server might store is something that looks kind of like gobbledygook, you know, 0, 1, A, B, something, 3, etc., associated with a particular username. And the idea is that uh, when you want to validate the password, you would have the user enter the password take the hash of the password, and then compare the hash of the password with what you stored in the password file. Okay. The nice thing with the scheme is that if the attacker, or if an attacker, gets their hands on the password file, then all they're really seeing are the password hashes and not the actual passwords that were used to generate those hashes. In other words, what they see is the image, but they don't actually see the, the pre-image, so to speak. Now, in theory, if a cryptographic hash function is pre-image resistance and, and all else being equal, it is computationally hard to find the pre-image. In other words, if, you, if you've seen, uh, if there's a value x, the hash function is applied to it to get a value y, it is very hard to go backwards. Given y, it is hard to find x. It's computationally infeasible to do so, all else being equal. Okay, and, and let me kind of give you some sense of how complex that might be. Um, if you have a good pre-image resistant hash function, then the fastest way to typically invert a good function like that is via what we call brute force, and that's to really try all possibilities, brute force. Uh, so imagine we had a function like SHA-1, and, and SHA-1 is a secure hash algorithm. It's um, actually not that secure anymore, but but it's been uh, there have been some collision attacks on it, but it's, in terms of pre-image resistance, it continues to be um, there haven't been any kind of major uh, kinks in its armor in that area. And it has an output size. It actually has, uh, the output is 160 bits. And if you have a 160-bit output, if you have a 160-bit output, that means that there, there are 2 to the 160 possible output values, okay? And that means that you, if you wanted to, let's say, break this function by brute force, and, and what that would involve doing is trying all possible input values until you find an output value that matches. In other words, let's say you've got you've got a value uh, y, and let's say y is secret, and you wanted to find out the x, the x that was used to generate this y, and let's say x was used to generate y via a hash function. Uh, what you would basically do is try out all different possible values for x1, x2, and so on, until you found something that mapped to y. Okay. Now, if you've got about a 160-bit output, you would probably need to try somewhere on the order, and this is a, there's a bit of a fudge factor in here, but somewhere on the order of about 2 to the 160 possible, 2 to 160 possible x's. Okay, it's not quite true. You can, you'll probably find it when you're about halfway through and, and a bunch of other things, but it's, it's about 2 to the 160. Um, and 2 to the 160, this is a huge number. This number is something like a trillion, 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 trillion. It's actually... You know, if I had to write this number out, it would be a one followed by a one followed by something like 48 zeros. 48 zeros. That's a huge number. Okay. Um, you know, that there's just no way you could you could do this in practice. And and even if you invested literally all the computing power that was available on the planet Earth towards this one effort, and you did it for a trillion years, you probably wouldn't even come close to finishing a task like inverting SHA-1 using brute force. Now, that's a theory, at least. Um, now, in practice, it, it turns out there's a, there's a bit of a kink in, in the argument I've made. In practice, an attacker can take a far more intelligent approach than doing naive brute force. Okay, Instead of trying all possible hash values, which is what you would do with naive brute force, the attacker can actually focus only on those that have a good chance of actually being a password. Okay, and here the attacker is basically exploiting a very simple reality. And that reality is that most users, your typical user, chooses simple passwords. So basically users choose simple passwords. They don't choose complex passwords. They choose passwords they can memorize. They choose passwords that um, you might even be able to guess if you use something about that user. Uh, so for example, what, what do a lot of users do when they choose passwords? Um, you know, imagine, you know, a lot of users might literally take 
something like, they might actually literally take a dictionary word. They'll take a dictionary word and, and they'll maybe add you know, a digit to it. So maybe it'll be something like, you know, secret, secret seven. Okay, that's, that's their password. And then a lot of people choose passwords of this nature, or if they do something more complex, it's, it's not that much more complex than, than a password like this. Now imagine you, know, you, you looked at a typical dictionary in English, and, and let's imagine there were, I don't know, 100,000 words. Actually, it's probably bigger than the typical vocabulary of, a, of an average uh, person, and so even 100,000 words would, would be a lot to, to consider choosing from. But let, let's just be very, very uh, conservative here and say it's 100,000 possible dictionary items. Uh, there are, um, there are uh, 10 possible digits. And so one question, we can pause the video and think about this for a moment. If you have a dictionary of, of 100,000 possible words and a user actually forms his or her um, password by taking one of these dictionary words and appending a single digit to it, how many possible password combinations are there? Okay, you can figure that out actually by multiplying the number of possible digit combinations with the number of possible passwords, and you get 100,000 times 10, which is basically 1 million. So there are about a million different possible passwords that kind of conform to this one scheme. And that number is really small in terms of, of security. In fact, it's easy to try millions of password combinations per second on a single, you know, suitably strong computer. And in fact, you know, an attacker I mean, can try many more passwords than just a million. Uh, you could try things like two digits after a dictionary word or, or combinations of dictionary words or, or common three-digit patterns like one, two, three after a dictionary word and, and so on and so forth. And so, you know, as you can imagine, this type of attack, uh, which we call this, this type of attack, given that obviously the, the name dictionary uh, lists in the attack and obviously the title of this video is dictionary attacks, this, this attack is called a dictionary attack. It's called a dictionary attack because the attacker basically creates a large dictionary and then tries to find the pre-image for a given Y, a given password hash, from an element of this dictionary. Okay? And, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can do this much faster than trying to brute force your way through the whole thing. Okay, this video should give you maybe a flavor of what might constitute a dictionary attack, and I'm actually going to stop this video right here. In the next video, I'll talk more about dictionary attacks, and I'll talk about some considerations for um, what you might see in an actual dictionary attack.